It wouldn't be a technology event with a few tech, tech errors. So I think we've got this covered. Speak up. Got Thank it? you. Beautiful. All right, Clark, take it away. There is no answer to what's the meaning of life. But there's a question how to create a life full of meaning. We've been trained to seek answers, and we've forgotten to ask questions. There is a massive disconnect between the answers we seek and the questions we ask. Bridging this disconnect is what we're here today to do. I'm going to give you three questions to change your life. But first, the answers aren't everything, even in the most brilliant answer-oriented minds. Top summa cum laude graduates, the very 4.0 students at large universities, when they were administered their same final exams, just one month post-graduating, the results, not one of them passed. Over the last four years, I've been uh, having an absolute obsession, not with questions, but with answers. It led me to read hundreds of books on personal development, positive psychology, uh, self-help, and it wasn't until I started closing the books and really started asking the questions that my life really started to change. So today I'm going to give you three questions to change your life. Do you have the slides, James, by chance? Awesome. But before that, I want to give you the spark challenge. Right here, one question, one week, ten minutes. For the next week, I want you to do, just for 10 minutes a day, answer one of these three questions that I'll give you today. I don't care if you're driving and you need to talk out loud about it to yourself, that's great. If you're a journaling person and you need to journal about it for 10 minutes, that's great too. However you do it is the right way to do it. I want to give you the first question, but first I want to give you a story. The story's about a troubled high school in the South. Now, Montlake High School was one of those schools that students were trying to do everything and anything to get out of. It was one of those schools that you hoped you did not catch a red light at. It was one of those schools that was so bad they would pay teachers to teach more at. So needless to say, Principal Watson had his work cut out for him when he arrived on the first day to Montlake High School. He stops, parks his car, takes his briefcase, turns, and as he's getting out of the car, he sees a wall covered in graffiti. He can't even read his own school's sign because it is from the top down graffiti ridden. And this isn't even the cool kind we have in Seattle, right? This is the bad kind. Stuff that looks like the kid's first painting. Fell off a ladder halfway through, right? That's what we're talking about. So when Montlake High School held a board meeting about what to do about the graffiti, answers started coming to Principal Watson. We should punish the kids. We should make them pay for the graffiti. It wasn't, see, Principal Watson didn't even look for the answer, how do we solve the graffiti problem. He pushed those answers aside and he said, what is the question that needs to be asked? What does this school need? Clearly something's not being met if we have a graffiti issue. So he didn't listen to any answers, he asked questions. And for the next year, he wrote letters of praise every time he caught a student doing something good. Letters would go home at 3 p.m. on the regular. Brittany is such a great student, she got all A's. Chad helped Veronica cross the street. Kelsey and Emmanuel are doing better in class. These letters started to go home day after day after day. They thought he was crazy, but after two months, there was no new graffiti on Montlake High School. And on the one-year anniversary, Dr. Watson parks his car, takes his briefcase, steps out, and loud and clear, he can read his own sign, Montlake High School, because there is not a stitch of graffiti on the school. See, what Principal Watson did is what so many of us forget to do. He asked question number one, how do I focus more on the good? Now, make no mistake about this. This takes work and dedication. It's not some uh, surface level, everything's going to be pink fuzzy clouds and rainbows, right? This takes hard work and dedication. And I know you know me as the guy speaking on stage at the Spark Summit, but I am by nature a pessimist. And it's not just me. I'll get to that. I'm by nature a pessimist. If it wasn't for the books and cool summits like this, which you guys are all at right now, I'd still be walking around thinking that uh, Y2K was the end of the world. Right? Zombie apocalypse is going to be on Seattle, and they're going to rip our face off. And in 2012, the world really will implode. Okay? But it's not just me. We are all pessimists by nature. Because get this. Guess how many thoughts you have a day? Is it 1,000? 
Is it 5,000, 10,000? No, in fact, research at Stanford shows it's 60,000 thoughts a day. That's 60,000 questions you can ask of how do I focus on the good. But I'll get to the pessimist part. What's more fascinating about the 60,000 thoughts is that they were analyzing those people in the lab and they found that on average, 90% of those thoughts were the exact same thoughts as the day before and the day before and the day before. And what's even more fascinating is of those 90 repeating thoughts, 80% of them were not positive, they were negative. So you can imagine this, we have 60,000 thoughts a day, 90% of the day before, 80% are negative. And you guys thought this was the uplifting talk of the day, right? So we are all pessimists by nature. Question number one, how do I focus more on the good? It's about adding in what's working. Okay, I used to do health consulting, and a lot of people would come to me with uh, diets written in Coca-Cola and, and McDonald's cheeseburgers in the morning, right? Drive through, drive through breakfast. And I, I wouldn't even touch any of that. I would say, look, obviously something's not being met. The answer is not to pull out. What's the question? The question is how do I focus more on the good? I'd say, Jessica, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to add in half your body weight in ounces of water a day. Don't you think naturally if they're drinking more water, they're drinking less Coca-Cola? Don't you think naturally by adding in the good, you only have so much room, you can push out the bad. Clearly, 80% of negative thoughts, how do you focus on the good? How do you add in what's working so you push out the 60,000 thoughts that aren't? Okay, and this takes work and dedication and something that's so important and ties in with question number two. Question number two, how do I integrate fundamentals? Fundamentals, the things you do every day on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, perhaps one of the best single illustrations of fundamentals comes from legendary basketball coach, John Wooden. Does anyone know the story of John Wooden in this room? All right, I saw a few hands, I saw a few hands. Coach Wooden was so notorious, so great at the way he coached basketball, that his teams won 10 NCAA basketball championships, seven back-to-back of, ten, of uh, 12 attempts, there we go. Th four of his teams won 30 wins and zero losses. He holds a standing record for 88 consecutive wins in a series. But Coach Wooden is not remembered for his success, but he's remembered primarily for the way he coached his teams. See, for Coach Wooden, it was about the fundamentals. For Coach Wooden, what were some of his favorite sayings? You know, a winning coach like this. Was it, keep your eye on the prize? and only losers quit? No, in fact, some of his favorite sayings were it takes 10 hands to make a basket. And the carrot is worth more than the stick. But again, Coach Wooden focused on the fundamentals. He didn't look for the answer, how do we win the game? He asked the question, what are the fundamentals? So players would come to him and he would be so surprised when they would come to him wanting the answers to how do we win the game? That the first thing he, Coach Wooden did is he took players down into his locker room. He sat them just like this setting. He took a knee. He reached into his back pocket and he pulled out a sock. Because for Coach Wooden, if the players didn't know how to put on their socks, that meant they might get blisters. And if they got blisters, they might twist an ankle. And if they twisted an ankle, they might be out for the season. And if they're out for the season, they would lose the championship. Coach Wooden knew it was about the fundamentals, the day-to-day -day things that make you great, make you who you are, and get you on the track to success. The 60,000 thoughts of focusing on the good, the day-to-day -day is what we need to do. Now, I want to give you three questions right here. I know we're talking about three questions, but let me give you a sub-three. This was an exercise that really uh, I do quite a bit and opens my eyes. I love doing the exercises. I'm sure you, you do as well. It was given to me by my coach, Dr. Scott. So I want you right now to think of three separate areas in your life. If you need to write this down, that works too. You can do it in your head, however works for you. Three separate areas in your life. This can be family, health, relationships. Okay? It can be spirituality, finances, business. Three separate areas in your life. Now, I want you to think of one thing you're currently not doing in each of those areas. One thing. Did you make a commitment to run every morning, New Year's, and you haven't been running? Did you make a commitment to call a friend every day and you're not calling them? Did you make a commitment to get healthy this year and maybe you haven't done so? One thing you're not doing. There's no shame in that. It's just getting honest. 
Now, next to that, I want you to think or write, what's your excuse? What's your excuse for not doing that thing? Is it I don't have the time? I don't have the resources? I don't have the ability? Now, ask yourself, how good is that excuse? Scale of one to 10. How good is that excuse? You got it? Now, this is the real kicker. How similar are those excuses? See, so much of our not doing is habit-based. We have similar patterns. We say we don't have enough time, and we forget that it's really about the fundamentals, the day-to-day -day things that really make us great and make our lives great. It's the putting on the socks to avoid blisters on the day-to-day -day things. But let me tell you, none of those two questions really even matter without the third one. The third one is something that's so, uh, so eye-opening. At the end of the day, you gotta ask, what's it all for? Question number three. So many times uh, working with men and coaching men, I see them row, 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 only to find that their boat is pointed upstream. So many times we all climb, 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 only to find, as Stephen Covey says, our ladder's on the wrong wall. How do we turn the boat around so it's downstream? How do we make sure our ladder's on the right wall? You ask question three, what's it all for? Now to do this, I want to uh, read you guys a story. One that when I heard really instantly opened my eyes. But while I'm doing this, I want you to be asking question number three, what's it all for? An American businessman took a vacation to a small coastal Mexican village upon doctor's orders. Unable to sleep from an urgent phone call the first morning, he went out to the pier to clear his head. A small boat with just one fisherman had docked. The American complimented the man on the quality of his fish. How long did it take you to catch this tuna? The American asked. Only a little while, the Mexican replied. Why don't you stay out longer and catch more fish? said the American. I have enough to support my family. Give a few to my friends, the Mexican said, as he unloaded them into the basket. The American asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? To which the Mexican replied, I sleep late, fish a little, play with my children, take a siesta with my wife, Julia, and stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life, senor. The American laughed and stood tall and said, sir, I am a Harvard MBA and can help you. You should spend more time fishing, and with the proceeds, buy a bigger boat. In no time, you'd have a whole fleet of fishing boats. You'd control processing, distribution, manufacturing. You'd make tons of money, way more than you're doing now. You'd have to leave this village, of course, and move to Mexico City, then LA, and finally New York, where you could grow your expanding enterprise with proper management. The Mexican fisherman looks up and asks, but then what? That's the best part. When the time is right, you'll announce IPO. You'll sell your company and make millions. You will become very rich. Millions. Then what, senor? To which the American replied, then you can move to a small Mexican coastal fishing village where you could sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take a siesta with your wife, Julia, and stroll into town each morning where you could sip wine and play guitar with your amigos. At the end of life, are we here to do as much as we can? Or are we here to be as much as we can? It's about asking the questions, not always looking for the answers, right? It's about focusing on the good to remove the graffiti on your wall. It's about integrating the fundamentals to avoid blisters, all while asking, what's it all for? Where is my ladder leaning? There is no answer to what's the meaning of life, but there's a question how do I create a life full of meaning? Stop worrying, is this the right answer? And start wondering, is that the right question? Seattle, you guys have been awesome. Go Hawks. Sure, yeah. Looks like we have time for some, uh, some questions. Sorry, James, I st <laughs> stole your line. Okay, anyone has questions, I'd be happy to help.
Sorry, what's your name? Shan. Shan. Thanks for the question, man. Yeah, so I just, uh, I work with men online via Skype all around the world. Um, I've been doing that for two or so years, mostly, mostly age group between the ages of, of, of 30 and 40, and just sitting down and, and asking them tons of tons of questions, right? And kind of working with them through things, whether it be they, they want to be uh, successful, more successful than they are, or they want to go places in life that they feel they need uh, accountability for, really, you know, make some solid goals or solid, uh, solid, solid goals and action steps towards them. Coaching's all about taking success and making it bigger, right? And uh, so that's what I like to do. Cool. Thank you. I'll be around. Thanks, James. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right. You've got about five or ten minutes, uh, and then we'll get back to it. In this room will be Steph Sharma, uh, your well-being realized. And uh, upstairs will be Justice Kalo Rain, uh, Daily Intentions. So check the schedule, decide which one you want to go to, but you've got about 10 minutes. You should be meeting each other because you could be partners, you could be lovers, you could be X, Y, Z. But uh, we, we've actually gotten a first marriage out of one of these events, so we're pretty happy. But yes, please go and meet each other. You've got about 10 minutes, and we'll do two more talks before lunch. All right.
Yeah, we'll actually put them up today, I think. Yeah, put them on. All right, I think we're going to kick off. So I like the fact that we're getting a little bit more energetic. We're all waking up. I know we didn't have enough sleep, but you guys should have. And because I didn't have enough sleep, I sort of forgot something teensy, teensy tiny, important detail. We're a data-focused company. We like to know what works and how to improve. So if you see over to the table right here, there is a table with two question surveys we're trying to do for every single session. So the past two, I'd like you to go and fill them out for the last two for Clark and Pablos, and definitely for Steph coming up. But just a very, very quick two-question survey to find out what you're liking, what's working, what's not. Okay? So every session we do, we're going to collect a little bit old-fashioned way because we've tried tech. We've tried to do it with mobile phones and QR codes. It sounds good in theory. It doesn't actually work so well. So our low-tech solution is in a lovely volunteer, pen and paper, and you guys filling out. So thank you so much for that. All right. It's my pleasure to introduce Steph Sharma. Uh, she's the owner and director of Lead the Difference. Uh, besides being an inspiration, uh, she's... <laughs> I was going to leave with this, but she's uh, an influencer of how we lead change. Um, focusing on motivating from within the heart, and she's also a student about business strategy, how you can achieve greater results by bringing the heart into the business. And the fun thing I learned about her is that she likes to raise and train horses uh, naturally, which is kind of a cool thing. So I want to just introduce you to Steph Sharma, so everyone please give her a hand, and welcome to stage. Thanks. Your clicker is here, you can use this one or this one. Okay, the clicker's up here. Yep. Take your pick. Great. Good morning, all. Thanks for your time and attention. Um, we're going to work um, during this session. So I have a lot I can say about well-being. I came from Gallup, and if any of you know the Gallup poll, Gallup released a book about 10 years ago, a little less than that, called Well-Being. And that was my introduction to well-being. So that's the caveat. There's a lot of research there, but there's a lot more research that you're going to have uh, references to. I want you just to take a minute, and on, one, on the back of one of the handouts I gave you, because I want you to keep these for next week as well. I want you to write down how you define well-being. Just today, right now, how you would define well-being based on your knowledge, based on your reading, based on research, based on your guess. I have no more, so I'm so sorry. Um, if you can sit by someone, then you can maybe write on a, okay. I did hand out two pages. If you're missing that, sit by someone that'll let you kind of copy. And do they have access to all these slides? OK, great. OK, somebody want to share what they came up with for well-being? Yes? Did you guys, you'll look at my handout first. OK, good. That's awesome. Great. Other ideas? For well-being, yes. Wow, that's quotable. That's quotable. And your session, Clark, was such a great, like, entree to what we're going to talk about. So thank you for that. I need to recognize that. Other thoughts about what is well-being to you? Those two cover it for everyone. One more person, share what you thought, what you think well-being is. Yes. 
Sense of purpose, great, thank you. Well, historically, we haven't thought a lot about well-being in the workplace. Maybe some of us have because, or, workplace, or well-being in our lives. Maybe some of us has, have because it interests us. Um, but my research and the catalyst for, for our company and our focus has been that companies are missing a huge opportunity to connect with you at the individual level. And so that's where kind of some of our research came from. And I don't want to talk to you as if you're employees as much, but I do want you to think about how you contribute throughout this quick, quick session that we're going to do and how you, are, how you do your best. Um, how many of you have done StrengthsFinder before? StrengthsFinder assessment, okay. That's just one tool like a Myers-Briggs, like a DISC that helps you kind of know where your strengths are. And as Clark said, we don't focus enough on the positive. Um, that's another tool that helps you. What am, I, what am I best at? What do I do really well? Well, well-being is more than that. And well-being is also more than what I would say the US has, has consumerized, and that is what? Wellness gyms. And companies saying, we focus on well-being. We have a gym. We, we give you a 50% discount on your membership. This is crucially important. It's the physical health right, of well-being. But this has been our predominant focus. Why do you think that is? It's easy? How is it easy? Uh, it's, it's easy for them to give some recommendations that will help them with support. Right. Why else? <clears throat> exactly. There's the monetary motivation, which is also important. Aparna. The Google factor, right? <laughs> we have meals, we feed your family, we have a gym, why would you wanna leave? Um, so, and I love Google, but exactly. So what we found in our research to move right along here is that it's really been a one size fits all. And when we think about the world, where the world is headed, and we've done a lot of research on generations and the intergenerational connections, we've learned that this one size fits all isn't, isn't what works for motivation. Um, and so getting back to some points that have been made by the two preceding speakers, it's, it's let's take a step back and think and ask ourselves, what for? Why be well? What's my, what's my motivation to being well? It's not a gym. I run every morning with my dogs. I don't need your silly gym membership. How are you going to connect me and my energy in such a way? And what we realized through, through a lot of reading and a lot of secondary research is that you have to be the definer of that. And that's how behavior changes. That it's not someone doing something unto you and managing for you and telling you what you need, although we've gotten used to that, haven't we? Um, it's about, it's about what you, what, what's your tree of energy? What gives you a source of, of motivation? Um, and so this is a really long quote, but this is a phenomenal research paper. And um, before Drive was written by Pink, a lot of his research came from, from this research. And um, there's a link on it on the, on the slide, so you can link to this paper for the academicians in the room. Um, but it really talks about eudonic well-being. Eudonomic well-being, I apologize. And this is about a greater sense of happiness, a greater sense of, of, of connection. So we're getting at that more heartfelt well-being, right? Um, but that still doesn't say what gives me that heartfelt well-being, what gives me that sense of greater purpose. Um, and so I want you to think a little bit about purpose. And I want you to draw on the same back of the, on the back of a piece of paper, just draw part of a quadrant, draw the x and the y axis. And at the point where the x and y axis are, you're going to write pleasure. And then you're going to draw an arrow straight up from the middle. Are you following me? So you're going to draw an X and a, draw your axes, and then you're going to draw a line up from the middle. Okay? And at the very point where those three lines meet, that's pleasure. Halfway up the line is passion. At the very end of that 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 line you drew through the middle of your your lines is purpose. Okay? So what do we as a society cater to? Pleasure. What's in my Starbucks drink? <laughs> right? It's, I mean, just these choices that we make, um, the questions that we're asked to launch off our sessions are all very quick stimulus. Passion gets a little bit more at what? How I spend my weekends, maybe. If I pay money for a hobby. What does purpose get at? 
and what for? And so purpose, who said long-term goals? So purpose is longer-term happiness. It's longer-term connection. It lasts longer when you connect with it. So when I think about you saying, I'm going to go life hack, and I care about my, my life in such a way that I'm going to improve my, my contribution, which I wish would replace the word productivity, but my contribution in the way that I define it, I think we have to start with purpose. So I want you to take a minute and I want you to write down today the answer to what is my purpose. This could be your purpose today. You're confused, you're in a career change, you're at this life hack event for a reason, don't make me define my future of you know, 50 years. What's my purpose today? What's my purpose this week? Is it to feed your dog in a healthy manner, to, to take care of you know, a young child? Is it to, or is it something bigger? Do you know, have you always known that at some point you will do X? This can also be called a calling. We just finished a study on this, a six month study on purpose. Um, and a lot of people that we talked to said, you know, it was my calling to heal people. It was my calling to do this or that. So just write that down. If you haven't written something down, I want you to take just a second and write that down. What is my purpose? My purpose is to You can have many purposes as well. Okay. So just a real quick definition that you'll have in your slides is what we've come up with. Um, and Gallup Science came up with five, five components of well-being, and we think there's, there's more. Um, we think those are too limiting from, our, from what we're reading out of the UK and some other really, really amazing uh, research. And probably Gallup's will evolve as well. A combination of individually defined elements, individually defined elements, that means you define the elements of your well-being. And you own that, and you're empowered to affect that, that support a holistic approach to individual thriving contribution and happiness. So this is about getting up in the morning and either being that productive fisherman on the beach um, or being a productive contributor to a volunteer organization or whatever it is. So you have a handout. Um, there's really, we think, two dimensions of well-being. The external elements are the things that are important to your interaction with the outside world and your internal elements are all the things that define who you are. So on the handout that you have, I apologize, there's I think two people that don't have it or one. Write your purpose in the middle, the purpose that you just wrote. Does everyone see that? So my purpose is, and then I want you to take a minute and I want you to circle or write in, first of all, your internal well-being. My internal well-being is, most important, the things that are most important to my internal well-being are my mental health is most important to me, for example, you might say. Or you might say, no, I feel pretty good about that. It's important to me, but it's not a focus for me. And then I want you to think about the things that drive your external well-being. And if there's something that's not written there, there's spaces, or you can write anywhere. This is your paper. And you're going to use this for your 30-day challenge. Okay. So circle the things that most resonate with you for your internal well-being and the things that most resonate for you for your external well-being. And if you want to participate, you can. If you want to sit by someone, you can see what they're... I, I don't have another handout, okay? All right, sorry to put you on the spot. Thanks for sitting in the front row, though. So take another minute. Are there things that are missing on there when you think about your internal well-being? Think about when you've been happiest in your life. Think about when you've been maybe not happiest, but you've had that good stress, the stress that drives you, the stress that makes you just work and flow. You don't realize the time goes by. What, what component of your well-being is that? Is it writing code? Is it, is it sitting and having coffee with a friend and sharing an idea? What is it? 
and try to connect back with some of these more tactical things about your well-being. There's still some writing, so I'm going to wait a second. You can also think about this as what's missing. If there's something that's missing from your life right now, might be a reason you're doing this weekend, what's the, what's the reason why that's missing? What's the, what's the feeder to that? That could be part of your well-being. It could be relationship-based. It could be financial-based. Okay. I put a couple quotes in here. Um, there's just some amazing research right now on, on feelings of happiness and well-being. Um, if you haven't read Tony Shea's book, Delivering Happiness, I highly recommend you read it. I, I got it on Audible, and he reads it, so it's kind of cool to hear him tell the story. Um, and a lot of his research you know, brought to light in a very practical way. Pink did the same thing in a very practical way how you can live with happiness by, ma by the choices you make at work, by choices you make with friends, by choices you make you know, with others. He lost millions of dollars, Tony Shea did, to build Zappos, um, and just kept losing millions. But the one thing he never stopped doing was ensuring that the people who were supporting his vision had fun and you know, were connected to their purpose. So it's a neat story. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to think about the things that you wrote down on your well-being chart, your externals at the top, your internals at the bottom, and you're going to think about these in two ways. What is the most realized and what is the most important? What is the least realized and most important? Okay? So if you see on the bottom of this chart that I have on the slides, I'm probably standing right in front of it, sorry, um, you can plot like, let's say you wrote down um, physical fitness. Maybe you're not as focused on that as you'd like to be, or maybe you're very focused on it, but that is, that is your foundation for well-being. If you don't do physical fitness, you don't sleep well, you're not easy to be around, that kind of thing. So that could be, if that's the case, most important and what most realized. You work out all the time. It's very important to you. So what we're doing here is we're what with your well-being? We're prioritizing. Why? Because it's so overwhelming to think about life improvement. It's so overwhelming to think, but I just need a job. It's so crazy for us to try to go, try to navigate this journey without prioritizing. So this doesn't mean that you're going to not focus on some of your elements, but I want you to write down from your sheet, you have another sheet now, I want you to transfer from your well-being sheet from this one right? I want you to transfer those themes into this one in each quadrant. And you can write them like I did. You can write them across the line. You know, if they're not quite as realized as you'd like them to be, but you're on the right track. Give yourself some credit. Are y'all following me? Okay. So just take a couple minutes and put, plot your themes down in this, in this matrix. And I'm less worried about less, least important, least realized. I might be curious about your least important, most realized, and we'll talk about that in a second. I found that I had a lot in least important, most realized, um, just based on lifestyle and habits and not really thinking, well, this isn't that important to me, but I sure am good at it. I want you to turn to someone that's close to you, and if you're sitting by yourself and you can just hop over and connect with someone, I want you to share, I want you to share, I mean, some of you may not have least realized most important, but that's the, that's the quadrant I want you to focus on. 
Um, and if not that one, then you focus on the most important, most realized. We're just gonna take a minute and I want you to share with someone what you plotted and why it's important to you. That's it. One of your most important well-being elements and why it's important to you. Okay? Go. Switch if you haven't switched. The other person needs to share now. Okay, did everybody have a chance to share? Okay, so that's, that's gonna tee up your 30-day challenge, is for you to set goals around your least realized most important well-being or your most realized most important. Why focus on most realized most important also? Anyone? Huh? Why focus? So I want you to focus. It seems obvious that you'd focus on your most important, least realized, right? Because you've got a priority that's, that's, that, that's really important to you, that, that drives your sense of purpose and drives your energy in a positive way. But why focus on most realized, most important, if you have stuff in that quadrant? Why? Good. Same thing. Great. Why else? <coughs> right. And it also gives you, because you're good at it, because you've accomplished it, it also gives you, and because you've proven to yourself you can do it, it gives you credit and energy for something that's probably been driving you naturally that you didn't realize. So for your 30-day challenge, things might come up to you between now and next week, because you're not just coming back tomorrow, because we'll all be um, either eating, drinking, watching football, or all three, or one of the three. Um, but I want you to think about maybe some elements that weren't on that sheet that you didn't put down. You'll have a chance to add to that quadrant, the most important, least realized, or the most important, most realized. Um, and then I would love to get feedback from you next week on what you selected. And you're gonna have a chart that helps you um, map all this out. Um, and I want feedback because you're an experiment on how we can individualize well-being in the world and how we can make that make sense of this from what you define and how you contribute whether it's at work or in the community so thanks for your attention and best wishes on 30-day journey that you have <laughs>